Jerome, welcome. We look forward to hearing your comments. Um, it took me quite a long time to write the book, and I think I went through uh, nine drafts. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit croaky. Um, and I wrote the book because, apart from anything else, a lot of people ask me, oh, where did you get that? Where's, that? where's the reference to that idea? And uh, there weren't any. So I, eventually I thought of put it all down. And um, I was, it took a long time, partly because I wanted to get uh, a lot of the different facets of uh, emerging markets in the book. Um, why? Because um, people have prejudices. And just um, really addressing a, a couple of the issues would have led to people saying, oh, yes, that's fine, but we can discount that because of X, Y, Z. We have, for example, pretty much a whole industry uh, in being negative China. It doesn't matter what, uh, uh, you know, you can rebuff pretty much any argument uh, about why, you know, the problems with China. Uh, it doesn't matter, people just come up with more, more reasons to be negative. Uh, it was a similar phenomenon in, in Brazil in, in 02, in fact. Uh, every three weeks or so, um, there, was, there was another reason not to do it. But I'm, I, I also want to really uh, emphasize that my book is a, a critique of finance theory. Uh, I taught economics a bit, and um, it's always struck me that, you know, I agree with Milton Friedman. If, if a theory neither, neither has realistic assumptions nor uh, testable results, it's not really very useful. And 90% and of finance theory, frankly, falls into that category. The inappropriate use of that finance theory uh, and I'm not questioning the academic rigor of, of what was said, but the point is the assumptions are not realistic. But the inappropriate use of finance theory has caused massive distortions in asset allocation, affecting hundreds of millions of people. Uh, we have uh, pension funds and institutional investors in the West uh, taking uh, massive risk concentrations, not diversifying where they should do. And likewise, we've got central banks in emerging markets who now own about 80% of global central bank reserves, uh, putting their money into things like US Treasuries. Uh, and there's basically, for a buy and hold investor, almost no major scenario I can think of where they're going to get their money back. Um, we live in a world where there are two major macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, one, of course, is the great global imbalance, uh, which is a result of the uh, huge uh, transfer of savings from the high saving countries in emerging markets uh, to the highly levered uh, what, as I call them, the heavily indebted developed countries. And um, then we have uh, the debt, this huge debt. If you count everything in the US, including unfunded Medicare, etc., we're talking about uh, 640 odd uh, percent of GDP, uh, sort of over 500 percent here in the UK. Um, these are very, very large numbers. We don't expect uh, fiscal austerity or any sort of fiscal measures to repay this. There are two traditional uh, ways of doing that. One is through uh, financial repression, which is what's being tried at the minute, and the other, of course, is inflation. Financial repression is about having a negative real interest rate. So you have uh, uh, low interest rates and then inflation a bit higher. And that brings me on to the history, a little bit of history. Um, we had, um, <clears throat> we've had uh, many, many examples of bank failures um, over centuries. And, of course, Badshot wrote the, the book on, uh, you know, how to, how to regulate banks, etc. The, the task has become much more difficult since the 70s because the move away from the partnership structure and the investment bank in particular, um, which was a result of changes in, in uh, uh, economies of scale, uh, the result of finance theory and, and computers, basically, has made uh, the self-regulating investment bank uh, not self-regulating, uh, management not only don't represent the interests of the owners, but they don't even have the capacity to observe uh, their staff properly. And so these institutions have been uh, creating huge amounts of risk, uh, systemic risk. Um, the lack of appropriate regulation, uh, together with uh, this uh, global imbalance, um, which pushed the US yield curve down to artificially low levels, created this huge great bubble. Um, when you have such a bubble, the first uh, uh, sort of normal sort of reaction historically is to seize the banks, uh, to sack the management, to um, uh, work out very quickly which lending is essential, continue that lending, uh, and deal with, with the bad loans uh, in a timely way. We didn't do that. Um, fiscal authorities didn't do that. We did it more or less eventually, you know, at different paces in different countries. But the, the, the burden of... of, of how to deal with the problem 
to avoid depression, to a large extent fell on monetary authorities, and so we had QE. QE, in my view, was primarily never designed to stimulate the economy. It was designed to save the banks uh, and thus to, to prevent depression. And um, the design of QE1 and QE2, which created a steeper yield curve, was clearly consistent with that. We have, um, <coughs> hey, sorry, we have a, um, a, 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 a very important role of central banks in um, uh, maintaining the myth that this was not about avoiding depression. Because, of course, depression um, uh, is a function, uh, according to Keynes, of uh, expectations and uncertainty. Um, if, we, if we define a la Frank Knight, and, and Keynes had the same sort of view, uh, uncertainty versus risk thus. Um, if you have a, a, a random uh, a set of random events, if you know the probability distribution, that's risk, because you can, and you can hedge or ensure that. If you don't know the probability distribution, that's uncertainty. So using that definition, and Frank Knight talked about one-off events. There is no probability distribution, in other words. Keynes' theory, in, a, in, a, in one sentence, apologies to Keynes, is that uh, when there's enough uncertainty in an economy, it will basically stop investors, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, employing more people, building new plant, uh, and that in turn creates uncertainty for others, which has a positive feedback, and that creates the depression. So the, the role of quantitative easing is very different to the, con the concept which was sort of sold in the market. Um, and it's morphed into a, a different thing now as well. It has a second function. The second function is to create zero interest rates and then have uh, inflation a little bit higher. And the optimal policy of central banks is again to bamboozle markets and the public, just as it was you know, with, uh, with QE originally, where the objective, if you like, was to tell everybody that the emperor has wonderful new clothes, get them to avoid thinking about the possibility of depression, get them to try and invest, uh, tell them everything was all right. Today, it's also about um, uh, getting them not to notice that they're being robbed. We know from behavioral finance uh, that people don't mind being robbed slowly, and um, especially if it's other people's money. Um, and the objective is quite clearly to erode the value of government debt over the next couple of decades. And financial repression this way, of course, was highly successful after the Second World War, both in the United States and Europe. If it doesn't work, <coughs> then you have, um, in other words, if, if markets uh, cotton on to the fact that they're being robbed, that they are, their savings are being eroded, then you have the potential to shift, I think, much more rapidly than people understand to the other way of ensuring a negative real interest rate, and that's inflation. And that's particularly problematic because of the high level of debt. Um, so you could have, uh, the thing that worries me most, uh, the most likely scenario is that this will happen when US growth really does recover. And I'm not talking about this year, I'm talking about next year. Um, the US uh, consumer has traditionally been the driver of US growth. Uh, that consumption has been a function to a large extent of uh, uh, household debt to income. And that, uh, th that statistic, of course, has gone up through the 70s, 80s, and then really uh, accelerated up uh, with the housing bubble. And if you look at the, 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 the initial fall uh, in that indebtedness, didn't, didn't really signify any more than, than housing defaults, which was then passed on to the financial sector. And subsequently, you're still deleveraging and to get down to a sort of level of 90%, which is sort of, I think, where, I mean, it's guesswork to some extent, but that would be my best guess about when uh, economic growth will really be driven by the consumer again in a serious way, that's the back end of next year. The idea that uh, the US is very healthy, um, I think, has to be set against the fact that still, uh, today, 46 million people in the United States are on food stamps, down from 47 million, true, but it's still a very large number. And the underemployment is, is probably estimated at somewhere between 15 and 17% still. So this is not, uh, it may be recovering, but this is not a, a full employment, uh, um, uh, healthy economy yet. And there are certain areas of the United States which are obviously still vulnerable. We also have vulnerability to um, another credit problem. Uh, we've, we've had 
huge inventory cycles in the US, which has created these sort of periods when people think very optimistically about growth, followed by disappointments. <coughs> and I don't see that pattern changing enormously uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the short term. What we also have, though, is um, a sense that the, the, uh, um, uh, when, when growth does, does come finally, we're going to see, I think, a, um, uh, a possibility that uh, bond markets will say, OK, I now expect inflation longer term. So clearly, the, the long end of the curve, will, will, the yield will go right up. And then that creates a, a, a problem uh, which can quickly uh, uh, accelerate in terms of government financing itself. Government will start to finance itself shorter term and shorter term and shorter term because, of course, the fear very quickly uh, can, 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 it, can, can become a, a market expectation that uh, government cannot possibly afford uh, to repay all this debt at higher interest rates because the, the stock of debt is too high. Because suddenly you're going you know, to, to a very significant uh, chunk of the, of the budget, the entire budget, to, re, to, to just service debt. So it's in this scenario that you can get some very big expectation shifts. Um, I did want to talk about emerging markets, though. I mean, I invest in emerging markets. I've, I've been quoted many times as saying I put 90% of my money in emerging markets, and I still do, um, over more than that. Um, and that's because I'm prudent. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I look at this from a macroeconomic point of view. You know, it, it's 56% of the world uh, uh, PPP GDP now, growing much faster, not got the same levels of debt at all, um, and uh, you've got a huge potential uh, to be unlocked uh, with things like infrastructure investment and, uh, and so on. South-South um, trade has gone from sort of 10% to 30% plus. We've got um, finally some, some, some real sense of, of, of moving towards domestic model of growth uh, in China in particular. And there's just frankly, uh, a, a, it's a safer, more diverse place to invest. But we don't have that in, in most of our asset allocation models. I probably haven't got time to go into some of the theoretical problems, but, but they do start in finance theory way back in the 50s. Uh, Markowitz, in a, in a big monogram, 360 pages in 1959, um, says that uh, you can explain the movement of a stock. Um, and of course, he, he equates, uh, quite wrongly of course, uh, volatility with risk. Risk is much more complicated than volatility. Most people care much more about large permanent loss than volatility. Um, and in fact, volatility can be a counter indicator of real risk uh, in certain situations. It also doesn't represent uncertainty. Um, risk is also not additive. It's very different for different people because they have different liabilities, different information sets, different speed, reaction speeds. Risk is complicated. And it's not just something that you measure. Toddlers, when they um, leave their bedroom, uh, close the bedroom door, up to a certain age, then don't believe that the bed that they just slept in exists. And the finance markets are a bit like that. If we can't measure it, then it doesn't exist. We just ignore it. Um, if we can't um, you know, put, push uh, uh, emerging market assets uh, into our normal conception of, of what's investable. By the way, that, does, that means easy to invest in. It doesn't mean it's, you can't invest in other things. Um, we just ignore it. But, but starting again with Markovich, he says the volatility can be explained, of a stock can be explained by the uh, um, idiosyncratic risk, as he calls it, volatility, the uh, uh, correlations or covariances with other stocks, and the correlation to an index. And then he writes, this is one sentence, but for computational ease, we shall ignore the covariances with other stocks. And that's it. It's from that basic simplification, which has no theoretical justification, um, and of course, there are, just think of, I don't know, different coal miners in, a, in an index. They're obviously affected by the same economics. They're going to go up and down. But that simplification, denying that possibility, has led in turn to a simplification uh, whereby we think that asset classes are represented by indices, that, um, that we have uh, the whole active versus passive debate uh, comes out of that. Uh, we've got a huge amount of, 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 of wrong, thi wrong thinking. But also, the idea of an asset class, of course, also um, uh, is a very interesting um, simplification. Um, an asset class, what is an asset class? There used to be two asset classes, of course. Uh, 
uh, US Treasuries and the S&P 500. Outside the US doesn't exist, of course. Um, and we've sort of gone a long way. You know, Svensson, the Yale model, now talks about uh, there being uh, possibilities to invest out, you know, abroad. It's okay maybe to have some investments in less liquid things. Um, but much, although that's a huge improvement, um, it's sort of still, it's a bit like a caveman who, who sort of works out how to create fire. Uh, it's still sort of, he's still a troglodyte really, or we're still troglodytes in using this very, very simplistic view of the world. What investors want is income, future income. Um, Andrew Smithers talks about that and, and replacement capital really being, uh, replacement costs, you know, Tobin's Cure, whatever, being the only two uh, ways of really valuing any, any stock. Um, but actually, it's not the replacement value that investors care about, it's, it's the income. And the best measure of future income is past income. And the best measure of past income is GDP. So that's what we should be looking at in terms of our global asset allocation. And if we're looking at GDP, real economic activity, I would argue we should be looking at PPP GDP. And that means that it's neutral to be 56%. And that's uh, in emerging markets. And that's, that's if you don't think that there are big, systemic, uh, highly correlated risks in the developed world, as I do. Uh, I see all the major big system systemic risks in Europe and the US, basically. Um, and, and this is sort of Tolstoy, I suppose. Um, <laughs> beginning of Anna Karenina, Tolstoy says, uh, uh, happy families are all happy in the same way. Unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. The emerging markets are highly diverse, highly heterogeneous. And there is massive uh, diversification value in investing across 60 emerging markets, much more than investing across Europe and the United States, which are actually highly correlated, and particularly because there's so much leverage, so much misperception of risk, so much concentration of the investor base. My three triple cocktail, if you like, of, 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 of warning signals for a, um, a systemic crisis, which I, I have a little theory about in the book. The, the emerging markets, therefore, should be seen as a way to reduce risk, to be more representative of real economic activity on the planet. And uh, we also have, I think, to recognize that because they are a way to reduce risk, uh, we shouldn't um, think of, uh, um, say, investing in, in, say, a US company that has revenues from emerging markets as being sufficient. When Lehman uh, fell in the United States, there, was pre there were press reports about Lehman in the UK having six billion in reserves, in cash. And people thought, oh, well, that's all right then. But then, of course, there was a six billion transfer. Uh, if you invest in General Motors in the United States uh, with the view that it's General Motors and it's American, therefore it can't go bust, and it's got all these great uh, revenue streams from the emerging markets, um, of course, General Motors did go bust. And so it doesn't matter where the revenue streams come from. Um, you are still taking the risk, uh, the macroeconomic risk of investing in, in the developed world when you, when, you develop, when, you, when you invest there. There's also a question about liabilities. Um, we've had inflation accounting for a while, but apparently uh, thinking about uh, liabilities uh, in terms of what pensioners, future pensioners really want appears to be a little bit beyond our industry. What people want is future purchasing power. They want, in 20 years when they retire, to be able to buy a car, fill it with petrol, buy food and all the other things. Particularly here in the UK, we're an open economy. So, and in 20 years, <coughs> I haven't done a detailed analysis, but just as an example, I would expect something like cars to be 90% produced in emerging markets, 90% consumed in emerging markets, and the price, the international price of a car will be set in emerging markets. Emerging markets are already price makers in uh, a lot of commodities. They will be price makers in a lot of goods and even in service markets, including in things like health markets, actually, health services, all sorts of things that we haven't really thought about. What that means is that <clears throat> if... If, your, if our pension funds do not invest in emerging markets today, then they are gambling away from our liabilities. We don't see that in, uh, in our standard presentations from pension funds. Um, now, one of the reasons why we don't see that is, of course, um, it's again coming back to this business of financial repression. It's the goal of, of uh, government to, to rob savers. As a, as a taxpayer, I fully agree with that. That's, that's an appropriate... Uh, policy, and much better uh, than, than, you know, inflation, which might happen anyway. Um, 
As a saver, however, I'm outraged because I'm being robbed. I've got my pension fund, which is being forced by regulation to buy so-called safe bonds uh, with the complicity of, of uh, effectively rating agencies who conveniently rate government bonds, you know, AAA or something. This can even increase systemic risk because it can create um, a, a, a greater concentration of the investor base. Um, let me say a little bit about that. I have a son who's done a couple of degrees in economics, and one, during one of them, he, was, uh, he sent me a paper, and it was a question attached. It says here, Dad, that you know, in, in Thailand, uh, nobody saw the crisis coming in 97. That's wrong, isn't it? I said, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> a lot of people saw it coming. I certainly told people to get out six months before, and that's, cause, that's only because I can read. Um, you know, the IMF was very explicit about the balance of payments uh, imbalance, and if that's not good enough, Soros had a massive, very public speculative attack, which only failed because the Malaysians and others bailed them out. So how could an academic, years later, write such a thing? And then you read on, the sentence says, um, that nobody foresaw it, you know, as evidenced by the fact that the spreads didn't uh, didn't uh, 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 widen out until the last minute. But that doesn't tell you people didn't foresee it. It tells you that some people didn't. The market is not homogenous. It has different players with different views of the world. I think one of the most interesting things I found, um, having done you know, several decades of investing, is how people have different models of the world. And it's when those models suddenly change. Um, this is sort of Kuhnian stuff. Um, that's when you get the interesting stuff. That's when you get crisis in particular. And so what was happening in Thailand was that, uh, you know, more and more people were having their eureka moment, realizing there was a serious problem, but all at different times, and they were exiting. And as they exited, other people who didn't see that uh, as a problem saw an arbitrage and they bought more. And over time, what you got was an investor base which became more and more homogenous until when that remaining homogenous group finally got the message, they all tried to sell at once, and that's when you get a systemic crisis. That's when you get a liquidity crisis. So we have the same thing with Greece. We have the same thing, actually, uh, arguably, with US Treasuries right now. The external, the external investor base is highly homogenous, uh, basically dominated by central banks. And central banks do herd, and they do cause crisis. They did in 1971. Massively. The dollar went from $35 an ounce uh, in 71 to it peaked at $194 an ounce in 1974. So big, big devaluation. And then, of course, you got a decade of, in, of inflation which followed, all sorts of other problems. And that was precipitated by European, then the creditor central banks. Well, today the creditor central banks are emerging market central banks. But, you know, we're years after 07, 08, so nothing seems to have happened yet. So why am I still talking about this? And the answer is, of course, that we haven't actually seen the adjustment yet. Herb Stein, advisor to President Nixon in 1971, famously said, when something's unsustainable, it will stop. It's a very sort of Forrest Gump statement. I like that. Um, but it's true. It will stop. And what's actually happened so far is that emerging market central banks have continued to send their savings to the United States. So you have about $11.5 trillion dollars of emerging market money which, uh, from central banks and another four or five trillion uh, from uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds, just invested basically in European and US sovereign bonds. This is orders of magnitude, by the way, more than the flow that might go the other way if there's a crisis in Europe. Yet we still live in a world where our core periphery disease, as I call it, is so dominant we don't see this. We think only in terms of the Western investor's perception. So we have this nonsense like taper tantrum. We, we have this idea that if we have a problem at home, that somehow uh, emerging markets have got to be worse off. And money must leave emerging markets because it is by definition riskier. If I'm standing on the top of a hill and uh, I'm looking at a, at a bird or an aeroplane, it's, it's going through the air and I'm, I'm uh, watching how you know, it's, it's sort of oscillating a bit. And I can call that, you know, that's risk. Um, it's due to air turbulence to some extent, but it's also due to poor navigation. And I can call this angle spread, by the way. Um, and anyway, it, gets, it starts to get worse. And in fact, all the birds in the sky seem to be uh, oscillating massively. And I'm thinking, wow, not only is the world a very dangerous place, 
but all these places are correlated. I'd better just, I'd better just not invest in them. Until, until we realize that we're not on the top of a hill. We're actually on the deck of a ship. And we have been becalmed, and now we're in a storm. It's us that's moving. Why is it, why is it that every time I pick up a newspaper article and it says, oh, you know, the Turkish lira has gone, you know, 8% or whatever it is against, against the dollar. Well, isn't that dollar strength? Why is it always that we think that that is lira weakness? You know, it is a, it is a psychological need to have some anchor, um, but actually we've got to start thinking a bit more complex. Um, I would like, I don't have enough time to really to say much more, but I, but I would like, if my, uh, uh, you know, my ask is that we start to get macroeconomics, uh, strategic thinking, scenario planning back into asset allocation. We need to uh, really uh, think about the, the big two global imbalances, the highly, uh, high levels of debt in the developed world, and these global imbalances, where central banks, the creditor nations, are going to be absolutely crucial to what happens next. And there are some very, very scary scenarios out there, um, and I'll probably finish at that point. Jerome. Jerome, thank you very much for that fascinating insight to what really is an yeah. upside-down world. It's um, comforting. We don't do settling messages at the FT, but uh, no. we've uh, continued our uh, theme of the day, I think. Um, we could sneak in one or two quick questions if there are any sort of urgent questions. Uh, if, if not, um, I would like to thank Jerome okay. once more for fascinating. I think you've stunned everyone. Um, <laughs> and we'll move on to um, the, um, the next panel. Okay, my Jerome, pleasure. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much.